Well, hello there. Thank you for joining me for the latest edition of Telil 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook, and we've got a packed show for you this week. We're talking about everything from the Port Hawkesbury waterfront to the Bredor Lake watershed. Later on, you'll hear some details of Cape Breton's troubled tourism industry and a new long-term plan for that sector. And you'll also get some ideas for a proposed new summer festival coming to Cape Breton. Yes, people are still trying to get events together for Cape Breton at this point of the year. But we'll begin with an interview with Brenda Chisholm Beaton, the mayor of Port Hawkesbury. We had some segments from our recent conversation on last week's edition of Tell Ale 24-7, but when I caught up with her earlier this month, she had so much to talk about, we decided to keep some of those segments for this week's show. Later on, we're going to talk about the town's troubled relationship with straight area transit, and you'll also hear why a town councillor wants to remove some barriers from a small park on the outskirts of Port Hawkesbury. But we begin with the issue of affordable housing. Earlier this week, the town wrapped up its three-month online survey for residents of Port Hawkesbury about what they'd like to see in terms of housing development. So let's check in with Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton right now about the response to that survey and why this issue is such a priority for the town at this point. We have made some progress and taken some steps with regard to housing uh, for this current term and, and certainly it was a priority for our last council's term as well. Uh, housing uh, first and foremost is uh, you know something I'm personally passionate about and um, something that I've also heard uh, from citizens at doors in, in every opportunity that I've had to to campaign from door to door. Um, In 2012, I was hearing about housing then, and uh, in just this most recent municipal election, I was hearing uh, about housing again. Now, uh, some of the challenges that that we currently face in the town of Port Oxbury around housing uh, is lack, lack, general lack of housing, all housing stock. Um, in particular, there there is little to no housing that is uh, physically accessible for for uh, for for people uh, who are differently abled, and and that is a, a gap that I hope that we can remedy. We have stricken a housing committee uh, that is locally based for just the town of Port Hawkesbury. We do participate on a regional committee for housing. Uh, called the Straight Richmond Housing Matters Coalition. So we we have participated with that committee for about four years or so now. Uh, So we thought, you know, it's important to have a housing committee that can have, um, you know, grassroots uh, local solutions to to our Port Hawkesbury's uh, housing challenges and housing opportunities. Uh, so that housing committee has uh, has met and will continue to meet, uh, you know, for the remainder of the term. And however long I believe that we will need a housing uh, committee till, knock on wood, someday we do have enough housing for for all ages and abilities here in the town of Port Hawkesbury. Uh, Another um, step that we've taken in uh, our housing file is to work with the Cape Breton Partnership to put together a housing survey. And why this is important is because, yes, um, I have heard at doors and so have other councillors and candidates. They've all heard at doors anecdotally that that we do have uh, housing challenges and a housing shortage and certain housing gaps. Uh, so it's it's great to be able to know those anecdotal stories, but even better to have the data to kind of back that up. So um, one of the functions of this housing survey will be to understand precisely what our gaps are uh, for for what uh, age groups and, and certainly, you know, is it for do we have a gap for students? Do we have a gap for seniors housing? Uh, accessible housing and for families so and what are the kinds of um, housing gaps uh, you know what are the needs of the people who are looking for housing so what's a little bit unique to the survey though is that yes it's going to identify um, the housing gaps the housing you know take give us a little bit of a fingers on the pulse of what the the housing demands may be um, but what takes that the next step is that the um, the survey participants, uh, we've asked them if you are looking for housing per Hawkesbury, you know, we want to know what it is you're looking for. But that added value is that those survey participants can actually volunteer their name and contact information so that we can work directly with developers and investors 
Uh, so it will reduce some risk uh, to uh, housing developments if they can have some predetermined occupancy be prior to, to building. Uh, so we hope that at the survey uh, will assist with uh, attracting new housing projects for, for the town. And of course, you know, uh, any kind of housing project, especially around affordable, accessible housing, uh, it could be, you know, apartment buildings, it could be single units, it could be duplexes. I mean, um, you know, the town of Port Hawkesbury is certainly open uh, to to replicating some of the kinds of housing we have now, but also looking at new and innovative uh, kinds of housing. Councillor Jason O'Coin did bring up the topic of tiny homes and micro homes and uh, mobile homes as well, and has asked council to consider, you know, is this a potential development that, that could be desired by residents of the town or people to, who would like to be residents of the town? Uh, so we're going to uh, flesh that idea out a, a little bit more as time goes on in terms of, you know, A, is there interest? You know, B, what are the zoning changes we may, may need to implement to make it happen? Uh, and to see, you know, sort of build a business case uh, if there is a, a desire uh, from from citizens to, to, you know, of course they would need to, to want that kind of uh, housing option. So, uh, and I think... Micro houses and tiny homes are, are really intriguing. A moment ago, you mentioned Councillor Jason O'Coin's idea for rezoning a part of Port Hawkesbury land to allow a subdivision for mini homes to set up. I'm just wondering if you feel that Port Hawkesbury has an advantage because it is home to so many different types of buildings that house people at this point. Everything from full homes to apartment buildings to mini homes. Does that work in Port Hawkesbury's favor? There's a couple of factors that um, that deter, you know, that that kind of give us a really good indication about demand. Um, so far, we've we've ha have close to 650 survey respondents. So that's a significant number. Like there, there's definitely a desire for housing. Um, just recently, uh, the Ch Strait Area Chamber of Commerce hosted a state of the Strait uh, gathering. I was able to attend, uh, and um, Sherry McLeod was pre one of the presenters, and uh, she said, you know. Certainly, real estate has been on the upswing uh, since COVID has has happened, and so much so that you know there there's very low um, uh, real estate stock left on the shelves. So she she did share that at that the the day of the state of the strait at at that point in time there were only two houses available for sale in the town of Prodoxbury, so not a lot of choice. So that uh, certainly is, uh, uh, I guess, a story whether or not uh, it's part of the COVID reality. Um, I think that there may be a bit of a changing trend for, for folks and where they, they may want to live. Uh, so perhaps in the past, pre-COVID, um, the trend was to, you know, maybe move to urban centres. And now I think there's a little bit of a reverse of that trend happening. Uh, so towns like Port Hawkesbury uh, become very desirable locations because they're, they're service centres, but they're in there close to um, a lot of the, the things and services and businesses that, that are uh, desirable uh, as a place to live. Um, and the population isn't quite as, as high. And so they can have a comfortable quality of life. Mayor Chisholm Beaton, I know that the Port Hawkesbury Affordable Housing Survey that had been online for a few months came offline on Tuesday. Can you give us a sense of what happens now with the information you folks have collected from that survey? We will uh, certainly take a look at all of the results to determine, uh, A, you know, what is the interest in, in housing and what are those particular um, housing needs and demands. Um, how many citizens have volunteered their contact information for investors or developers, and we can prepare presentations uh, for anyone who's interested, who's who's in the the housing. Uh, I guess you know whether they're an investor or whether they're a developer or whether they even have an interest in in developing housing uh, here in the town, and uh, see see if we can uh, make new housing developments occur. 
Now, you might remember that just a couple of moments ago, the mayor was talking about the State of the Strait event that was carried out by the Strait Area Chamber of Commerce earlier in April. One of the keynote speakers for that event was Terry Smith. He's the CEO of Destination Cape Breton Association, the main umbrella organization for the tourism industry in Cape Breton. He also made a presentation to Richmond Municipal Council's recent edition of the Committee of the Whole. So we thought we'd share Terry Smith's presentation with you to get a sense of long-term planning to help Cape Breton rebound from the difficult COVID-19 period and what lies ahead in terms of tourism promotion. Here's that presentation by Terry Smith right now. In the past uh, decade, we saw tremendous growth uh, in tourism on the island. Room nights sold, for example, in 2019, there was 110,000 more than in 2009, which is a significant increase. Visitation to the National Park went up significantly. Uh, cruise ship passengers, more than 100,000, uh, and it would have been more in 2020 if it hadn't been COVID. Um, the economic, economic impact of Celtic Colors more than tripled. So, uh, so we saw substantial growth. Um, and why a 10-year strategy now? Well, we didn't want to rest on our laurels and, and just uh, be happy with uh, where we were. We wanted to see how we can take the industry to the next level. And that's why we initially embarked on, on a new 10-year strategy. Um, some people have asked why a 10-year, because so much can change over three to five years, for example. Um, and but but having a 10-year strategy and a vision allows us to be bold, to really have an ambitious plan, and um, and that gives us something to shoot for. A strategy is something that it should be a living uh, document that uh, you're all, always going back to and uh, changing and adapting as needed. So so we see that process. You know we'll be able to adapt uh, as we go forward and things might pop up. Um, hopefully no more pandemic. One of the things that we're, we're going to focus on is care for community. So you've probably heard that in some other tourism uh, destinations that um, over tourism has, has been a problem. We haven't seen that so much here except for like maybe small instances. If you've been on the Skyline Trail um, late afternoon when the sun's coming down, you know, in, in August or September, you might have seen a full parking lot there or a lot of people there, those sorts of things. But usually it's not a problem. But we want to be proactive and make sure it's not a problem. So we, we want to develop this strategy so that we're planning in a responsible way so that tourism enhances our quality of life for our residents um, and never becomes something that has a negative impact. So that's going to be a key to the strategy. Uh, 365 day season. Currently, um, about two thirds of our business, tourism business, happens within a 15 week period from the beginning of July to the, the end of Celtic Colors. And, um, you know, there's a full 37 weeks other than that, that where we could be generating visitation and uh, providing a more sustainable in industry for our operators and for those who work in the industry. So, um, so working on extending our shoulder seasons, building winter, those sorts of things are, are going to be a key for us. So sustainability, but when we talk about sustainability, it's not just environmental sustainability, that's a big part of it, but also cultural, social, and economic sustainability. All of those are important. So as an example, um, it's very important uh, that we are renewing um, our, our culture with our youth, for example. So, so if the Gaelic College didn't exist and wasn't, uh, um, you know, training or or educating uh, some of our young young folks uh, in uh, things like how to play fiddle tunes or how to step dance, would that mean that Celtic colors wouldn't exist in a generation? So it's important that things like that be be part of the equation. So often we focus on just promoting the actual festival, but there's a whole bunch of things that you have to ensure are in place to, that lead up to that. Cluster focused. Um, it's funny, I, I work for uh, an economic development uh, organization in the, back in the early 90s. That's, that's how old I am. 
um, and uh, um, one of the uh, one of the, the buzzwords at that time was was cluster development, and it, it's come full full circle. But the reason it's come full circle is because it makes sense. So a cluster is essentially a group of like-minded companies, organizations within a particular sector that are in, in a geographic area. Our tourism industry actually meets all the criteria of what, what uh, makes up an economic cluster. Um, but within that, um, the, the, we also see that uh, there are certain product clusters. For example, our cultural tourism uh, uh, folks would be a product cluster that's very strong. Our outdoor adventure folks, our, um, our culinary folks. So we see three different product clusters. And what this is going to focus on is supporting those clusters and the overall industry by encouraging um, innovation uh, in a constant focus on trying to renew our product and, uh, and take it to another level and uh, with ongoing research that supports um, where things could go, looking at trends, seeing how can they be applied in Cape Breton. So that will be a big focus. And digitally driven. As you know, everything today is being driven by technology more and more. Uh, within the next couple of years, I think it's 97% of our island is going to be um, going to have high-speed internet. Um, I'm, I'm living in an area where my internet uh, at home is absolutely terrible, so I can't wait for some of that high speed to get to me. Um, but, um, but with that, we'll see that there will be more opportunities for us to uh, um, develop new solutions that, that can help our industry. So for example, um, addressing things like over-tourism, I mentioned the Skyline Trail that we might have an app developed that could point people to say, listen, the Skyline Trail is packed today, mm -hmm. but why don't, why don't you take a look at something that's in Richmond County where there aren't as many people where you could have a more enjoyable experience. So we might be able to disperse people around the island in ways that, that would avoid uh, over-tourism and, uh, and get them to see more of the beautiful place we have to offer. So that's just one, one example. But uh, the digital focus will be big. Once you get the strategy, you will see that within it, we have identified six what we call game changers. And these are areas where we, we feel there are, is room to grow the tourism industry. So those three product clusters I mentioned, cultural tourism, adventure tourism, culinary tourism, but also events. And events could be... Um, uh, meetings, it could be festivals, and we'll be looking at the creation of new events and working with partners to do that. Um, we'll be looking at supporting existing events in innovating, that maybe they could um, expand what they're doing or enhance what they're, they're doing to become um, a bigger and better event. Um, or attracting things like sporting events. We had the Scottish Tournament of Hearts a couple of years ago, so we'll continue to try to attract things like that. Um, green tourism is uh, another area that is going to be, uh, uh, I think, uh, key to your, your county. But in looking at the Bredore and all, but also coastal Cape Breton and uh, the water-based uh, activities that, that we have to offer, whether it's boating, kayaking, and, and so forth, um, there's much to be uh, developed there. And then I'm, I already mentioned uh, cluster development. So six game changers, and then there's six supporting themes. And these aren't necessarily areas where we see growth, but there are things that can be done to support the growth. Um, so experience development and continued focus on product innovation, sustainable tourism I spoke to, uh, strengthening our tourism business climate, and there's a, a number of things that we look at uh, uh, in that area. Things like placemaking, for example, um, could... Uh, could strengthen our, our business climate. Achieving excellence in visitor experience delivery. You know, things like uh, sense of arrival uh, when you come to the island. Things like that improve the visitor experience. They, they will arrive on the island, they'll get a proper orientation. They'll actually see that, you know, this is an amazing place from the time you cross the causeway. Um, and. Uh, Attracting, retaining, and training a skilled workforce is going to be key to us as we go forward. 
And then the final one is our organization and, and evolving our organization to to really support the uh, the leadership of this of this plan. This plan isn't something that we're doing all by ourselves. We're, we'll we'll be collaborating with many many partners and and a number of different organizations have all played a role in in uh, developing the plan. So within this, um, you know, there are, there are many areas that um, that we see that uh, Richmond County could uh, could uh, play a role or or benefit from this and. Uh, Perhaps once the plan comes out, uh, we can have another conversation at some point and, and look at some specific initiatives. Um, and, um, you know, uh, we've had a couple of discussions about trails, for example. There's an action here that talks about developing a comprehensive uh, trail strategy for the island. Um, I know the, the municipality is looking at a trail strategy that could be aligned with what's happening around the rest of the island and, and that would just make it all more uh, more powerful I think and more more comprehensive um, so that's an overview of the plan I do have a request um, so just so you know uh, going back a couple of years ago um, Richmond County did uh, provide an annual um, uh, amount to to destination Cape Breton. It was actually ten thousand dollars a year um, that was spent on prim primarily product innovation activities. Um, but but ten thousand was the same amount that you know some other municipalities were paying as well. I think uh, five thousand is is more um, is more equitable in terms of the size of the industry here in your county and. And that would be fine, fine for us. Um, the focus of this would be really looking at new things that we could do in terms of experience development, for example, season extension initiatives. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, uh, an experience development workshop specifically for Richmond County operators. Um, we had six participate in that, and uh, and we're doing some follow-up mentoring now with uh, with some of those folks. Um, and uh, we're we're looking at an, another initiative, a fairly brand new one, that will deal with uh, Acadian uh, uh, cuisine that that we're looking at. So so there are a number of things that we're doing that uh, could have a direct benefit on uh, operators and organizations within your county. So so that's my my request to you. And within that, we would uh, provide uh, an annual report um, at, at the end of the year to indicate exactly what we did with with that investment so um, I would greatly appreciate your consideration of of that request and uh, anything you'd need to support that I, I'd be happy to give that you, when, when you talk cluster development uh, you would talk like uh, intertwining all this stuff together like uh, you know uh, when it comes to tourism and, and the colony so Acadian meat pies in this area uh, fish cakes and beans all this stuff here right uh, is that what we talk about when it comes to Intertwining yeah. all these together. Yeah, and and for many visitors, e either either they they don't have the opportunity to experience traditional Acadian cuisine, or they don't realize that's what they're having sometimes. When they're <laughs> having um, so it's yeah. it's it's providing that education, but but there may also be ways to uh, to look at uh, innovative approaches to to that that as well. I, I'm not sure what that is, but I'd leave yeah. that to. Uh, to you know the chefs and and so forth, but yeah. but yeah, we we think that that's a great way. You you can tell the story of your culture partly through the food, and right. that's yeah. that's a great way that people can get introduced to it. I've been in the food sales industry for twenty eight years, so culinary is dear to my heart. But yeah. you know, when you look at the heritage of of Almadam and, and the Acadian heritage, I've always thought of uh, boat boat tours, a culinary experience on a boat. That would be amazing. You talked about the 365-day season. It's like the, the holy grail that we've all been chasing here on, on Cape Breton Island for a long, long time. But it wasn't lost on me that there was a large picture of a section of multi-use trail uh, in that picture. So can you just maybe like tell me a little bit about what you, you know, you know, at, from your ex expert opinion, like what's what does that look like? What could that look like for Cape Breton to turn our tourism economy more towards that 365-day season in terms of trails development? 
I think if you look at what, what's happening with some trails uh, in, in other areas, that was a photo of, of a fat bike that was on the Celtic uh, mm. Shores Coastal Trail. Um, that is taking a trail that, um, you know, is multi-use. It, it could be it could be that bikes are on it. It could be uh, that other vehicles are on it, motorized vehicles or just people walking. Um, and, and it's being used for seasons of the year. So something like that is, is a possibility. If, it's, if the investment is made so that the trail is built really well and maintained very well, um, it can be used uh, year round. Uh, I think it's important to have that, to have the planning up front and the investment there so that um, you know, it, it can be multi-use. Mm -hmm. um, that tr that trail, you know, in winter, that was a, a fat bike uh, a photo, but there could be a snowmobile photo that mm -hmm. uh, would have passed by, you know, five minutes before that, for example. And I, I think it's important to recognize that when trails are developed, they can be really multi multi use um, as long as they're done done properly and uh, and planned out and. Maybe some regulations are, are needed to ensure that uh, um, everybody is taking care of them the way they need to be mm -hmm. uh, taken care of. We're seeing a tremendous growth um, in snowshoeing, for example, on some of our trails. A lot of that would be you know, in the highlands where y you know, you're going to have consistent snow. Um, and, um, but the same people that go hiking there in the summer or the fall are coming back now to uh, to try to try it in winter, and uh, mm -hmm. and so that that's I, I think trails can be key to achieving that 365 day uh, season vision. This time of year, municipal councils around our region are trying to put their budgets together for the coming year and trying to determine who should get what in terms of municipal spending. And Port Hawkesbury has to make some difficult decisions in terms of straight area transit and what the cooperative will receive from the town. Earlier this month, Inverness County had some harsh words for the town during its regular council meeting, with the warden and several councillors suggesting that Port Hawkesbury's level of financial donations is not on par with those contributed by Richmond County and Inverness County. So I decided to put the question to Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton and ask why Port Hawkesbury is having such trouble in this regard and what some of the factors are in terms of how the town decides how much money it's going to be giving to straight area transit. In my understanding as a former board member for straight area transit, uh, the straight area transit uh, functions as a kind of a, on a service-based model. Uh, so the amount of funding that is provided from uh, participating municipalities kind of determine uh, the the level and amount of service that, that can occur to residents living in those those various uh, municipalities. Um, and for example, like in the past where Richmond had reduced their uh, contribution to transit, um, the service delivery for Richmond County was was also reduced to to accommodate that fluctuation. Um, so I guess one thing that the town of Port Hawkesbury will have to find out a little bit more information about, uh, maybe to kind of dig in into some of the details of what, you know, what do those services look like for uh, residents of the town of Port Hawkesbury, uh, so we can have a better understanding to to make sure that our contribution, our in kind contribution, is equitable in comparison to the services that our residents receive. So. Again, that'll be um, uh, some, some important work that'll need to be done with um, uh, our committee members on straight area transit so they can bring that information forward to council so we can uh, determine, you know, what is what is an equitable uh, sharing agreement for straight area transit. So that'll be yet to be determined. From the outside looking in, it seems like there are two factors in Port Hawkesbury's role in straight area transit that don't apply to the counties, specifically Port Hawkesbury serving more as a pickup and drop-off point than transportation within the municipality, and Port Hawkesbury, unlike the counties, has several active taxi drivers in the town. How big an impact do those two factors play as you try to determine what's appropriate for a financial donation to straight area transit? I do believe both of those variables do play into the conversation and, and certainly um, we do have uh, 
private enterprises that that um, uh, taxi companies that operate within the town of Port Hawkesbury. And I do understand that when, you know, I, I wasn't a municipal councillor when, uh, during the genesis of straight area transit. Um, however, I do know that there were certain concessions agreed upon uh, just to, to make sure that both, both of those uh, entities can coexist. Uh, so it's definitely a variable that, that we'll have to, to keep in mind as we have those conversations. And, uh, and, and also just to understand, you know, two things really, uh, Adam. Uh, number one, we, we do have to understand, you know, you know what are the services Pre presently being used by uh, residents of the town and you know maybe there's a latent demand that hasn't been explored maybe there maybe there's some desired services that uh, straight area uh, transit can can perform in, in their capacity um, and then go from there I guess it just more I guess more information uh, will help us determine a final decision. I was intrigued when you mentioned recently that Port Hawkesbury was actually hoping to work with Straight Area Transit to establish a bus stop within the town. Could you tell me a little bit more about that project and how it strengthens your overall commitment to Straight Area Transit as a municipal partner? Uh, so we've actually had conversations in my time uh, when I sat as a member of the Board of Straight Area Transit um, to use, uh, I think there was there's a location in Tamarack and a location just outside the Civic Centre uh, to be able to utilize buses that are already traveling to NSCC and Straight Area Campus um, with uh, rural residents on it. Uh, and allowing, I guess, an opportunity for folks from town who are also, you know, going to the straight area campus to, to be able to, I guess, finish their, their journeys on the straight area transit, and well, since it's going there anyway. Um, and, of course, you know, all the best way, well laid out uh, plans were disrupted by COVID, but it's, it's certainly uh, an idea, I think, as things kind of become a little bit more normalized in terms of um, in-person classes at NSCC and the Nautical Institute, that we can certainly dust off that idea to see if we can make that work. But uh, our town council is, is definitely open to uh, having a, another look and, and trying to better understand I guess the dynamic of the services being provided for all three municipalities and uh, certainly open to, to looking how it can be more equitable. The recent edition of Richmond Municipal Council saw a presentation on behalf of a group that's taken a major role in the stewardship of the Bredore Lakes watershed. It's called a CEPI, that's the Collaborative Environmental Protection Initiative, and it's overseen by a group of people including the two men that you're about to meet. Stan Johnson from Eskasoni First Nation is the coordinator of the CEPI, and Ron Newcomb is the associate coordinator. They decided to lay out some ideas for Richmond Council in terms of how to participate on the CEPI in the future, and in terms of a proposed new festival for Richmond County and the other parts of the Bredore watershed to help tie into existing events to promote the lake. Here's that presentation from Stan Johnson and Ron Newcomb of the Bredore Lake CEPI right now, including some discussion on what exactly a CEPI is. It was events like the sudden decline of the oyster industry in the Bredore Lakes that spurred on this need, to, the, the people could see there was a need for a management plan. And then other steps along the way were the formation of the Eskazoni Fish and Wildlife Commission in the early 90s. In 1999, UINR, the Unamagi Institute of Natural Resources, was established, another uh, important step for the Bredore Lakes. In the 90s also, there was a series of conferences and workshops that started to happen where people got together to talk about the, uh, the needs of the Bredore and protecting this ecosystem. But it was in 2003, kind of a milestone, it was uh, the first time that the First Nations chiefs sat down with the uh, senior government officials to actually talk about what could be done to protect the Bredore Lakes. And also in 2004, workshops started to be uh, conducted with non-government uh, uh, stakeholders in the Bredore Lakes too to discuss the same issues. And then in 2005, the CEPI was actually uh, came together, was born. Now, CEPI is a table where all levels of government, the uh, First Nations chiefs, mayors and wardens uh, municipally, 
the provincial ministers and federal regional directors general all sit together at the same table to discuss the common goal of protecting the Bordeaux Lakes and seeing them healthy and successful. So it stands out as unique, certainly in Nova Scotia, uh, certainly in the country, and many will say in the world, as a place where all levels of government sit together and talk about and collaborate together for a common goal. So that's quite an amazing thing. So all these levels of government all signed their name and supported this initiative. Uh, at that time, it was Warden John Boudreau, who represented Richmond County and committed Richmond to this initiative. As far as the organization of the CEPI, um, as I mentioned, it's made up of the First Nations chiefs, the mayors and wardens of the municipalities of Cape Breton, uh, provincially the ministers of the departments that exist here in Nova Scotia, and then federally the regional directors general of the Maritimes region for all the departments all make up the CEPI. They are what we call the senior council. But uh, they meet twice a year to oversee the operation of CEPI and, and to find out the issues that need to be collaborated on. But the actual like uh, nuts and bolts running, the day-to-day -day, uh, running of the CEPI, they've appointed a management committee to look after that. And that committee is representatives of each of these departments sit on that committee as appointed by the senior council. And it's chaired by Senator Dan Christmas and Councillor Paul McNeil from Victoria County. But that management committee is advised by a steering committee. And at the steering committee table, every uh, interested stakeholder has an opportunity to, to come together and raise issues of concern that need to be discussed. And then everybody can uh, discuss these issues. And the management committee then is able to take these back to the senior council. The management committee is also advised by an elder council led by Dr. Albert Marshall, and a youth council, which is led by Tracy Marshall from Escazoni. And the actual day-to-day -day running of, uh, of the uh, CEPI is looked after by Stan Johnson here. He's the coordinator for CEPI, and I assist Stan. It's just a small sampling of some of the things that CEPI has been involved with, with the partners. And CEPI is coordinated on behalf of the partners to accomplish work around the Bordeaux Lakes. And... Um, this was an interesting milestone as well. In 2011, the task team that supported uh, or looked at the management plan for the Bordeaux Lakes finally released this document, The Spirit of the Lakes Speaks, written from the perspective of the lakes. Now this, as, as well, stands out as something unique in the country and perhaps even the world because most people would expect to see a management plan that's a set of rules and regulations about how things will take place. But the Spirit of the Lakes Speaks document recognizes that the Bordeaux Lakes is an ever-changing ecosystem. And no one set of rules would cover every situation that will arise. It also recognizes that there's really no one body that has complete responsibility and authority to govern the, the Bordeaux Lakes. So it instead describes a management process plan uh, where everyone comes together to collaborate together using seven guiding principles and also the concept of two-eyed seeing, which if you're not familiar with, just basically at a very base level means having an eye on traditional Mi'kmaq knowledge and also Western science and using both of those to, uh, to reach a successful conclusion or outcome on any issues that are discussed. Also in 2011, I'm sure you're aware that the Bordeaux Lakes Biosphere Reserve Association was founded and that's certainly been a major thing for the Bordeaux Lakes. In 2016, the People of the Lakes Speaks conference was organized by CEPI to look at the idea of sustainable development on the Bordeaux Lakes. And out of that conference, uh, six areas of industry uh, were highlighted as uh, worthy of focus to consider and think about how these things could be pursued in a sustainable way. Uh, after the conference, certain task teams were formed, initiatives were undertaken to consider the things that uh, were brought up at the conference, but probably one of the most notable ones is the conference gave uh, a voice to young people in the area. So the youth were able to speak out at that conference and give their opinion and uh, their uh, input into what takes place around the lakes, so much so that our youth council has now developed into what we call CEPI youth. And it's kind of taken on a life of its own. In fact, they voiced their uh, idea that they wanted to have their own sustainable development conference, which was held in 2018 in Port Hawkesbury. 
And since then, they've engaged in many other initiatives. It continues to grow and, and has become a robust uh, source of advice for the management committee and thus the senior council. Uh, in 2019, CEPI partnered with the Biosphere to co-host uh, this climate change adaptation forum, uh, from which came a report which uh, gave recommendations for uh, climate change adaptation for biospheres, not only here but across Canada. And this is an interesting point because we've actually garnered a lot of attention both nationally and even internationally because of uh, CEPI being such a unique organization, many people come to us and say, how is it that you're able to get all levels of government to sit at the same table and calmly discuss issues to reach common goals? And so they've uh, studied CEPI and how it operates and its organization, and we're happy to do what we can to uh, spread the message. We are aware that municipalities are under a mandate now to develop a set of minimum development standards for your area. A few years ago, CEPI had developed a report on development standards, recommendations from municipalities, and we're currently in the process of uh, revisiting those to revise them and bring them up to date and also incorporate new things we've learned since then. The uh, first project mentioned there is a species at risk research project that we're conducting. So, for instance, we would like to incorporate information about species at risk into those development standards so that uh, we hope that the municipalities would, uh, could use this document to help you in your work there and that you would also consider uh, having information about species at risk in your development plans. Now I would like to show you uh, just a little bit about our work plan for this uh, fiscal year coming up. Usually the First Nations communities and the municipalities around the Bredor contribute $5,000 each per year to the running of CEPI. And our work plan is divided into four sections. Each section talks about a, a priority in our terms of reference. So uh, our core operating activities and the budget that goes with that. We have social and cultural priorities in our work plan and the budget that goes with that. Uh, environmental objectives in our work plan and the budget that goes with that. And lastly, uh, economic priorities and the activities for that and the budget that goes along with that. So you can see our total expenses are expected to be 309000 for this fiscal year. So finally, uh, I could just mention that CEPI would not be the success that it is without the partnerships that we have, without this spirit of collaboration and all of the CEPI members coming together to work as one. As Dr. Albert Marshall said here, if we all work together, there's absolutely nothing we cannot do. We've certainly seen that to be true over the last uh, 15 years or so that CEPI has been in operation. For this presentation to Richmond Council's Committee of the Whole, Newcomb and Johnson were scheduled to be joined by former Richmond Councillor Shirley McNamara concerning the sister organization Bidapa. While McNamara was unable to attend the meeting, Newcomb delivered her presentation about the history and purpose of Bidapa. Bidubog is um an organization that in many ways is very much like the CEPI, only it operates at a municipal level. So Bidubag was, uh, refers to, uh, the, the English translation would be flowing into oneness and refers to the Bordeaux Lakes and how it connects all of Cape Breton, all of Unamagi. And the shared goal is to preserve and enhance the social, economic, and environmental prospects in Unamagi, Cape Breton, for all seven generations. This just shows uh, the active members of the Biduba committee. Shirley McNamara is the uh, chair of the committee. We need a member from <clears throat> and we do need a member from uh, Richmond County here to, uh, to join that initiative and just, just to sit at that table. But it is an opportunity for all the municipalities around the lake to sit together and bring forward problems that you're facing, no doubt other uh, municipalities are facing. How can we work together to see these things handled? In, and First Nations. So it started with um, uh, really one of the first initiatives that it undertook was sewage in the lakes. And uh, this was a problem at the time, but Biduba took on a project together with First Nations communities and the municipalities to uh, do some work such as installing pump out stations for uh, recreational and uh, uh, commercial boats. And there's six around the lake now. And then uh, upgrading outdated sewage treatment plants at Waikagama and Wegoma. 
And so uh, this kind of kicked things off with the projects that Biruba does, but it, all of these are the types of things that it, it uh, undertakes so that uh, these municipalities and First Nations councils are working together for things that will benefit everybody. And there are many other uh, activities that it has um, undertaken in, over the years, but um, we've recently really reinvigorated the committee and uh, we have almost 100% participation from all the councils around the lake, so we would love to have you there as well. And um, these are some of the issues that, that we hope to look at soon in the, in the coming, uh, coming years. And Stan and I, as uh, CEPI, we support that initiative. And uh, also the Unamagi Institute of Natural Resources does what it can to support that initiative as well. But before Newcomb and Johnson wrapped up their presentation to Richmond Council, they had one more surprise for the councillors, specifically a summer festival that will take in several communities around the Bredor Lake and help to tie in with events already planned for this particular summer. There's actually, okay. too, another initiative that's uh, it's quite exciting that's being planned for this summer in the Bredor Lakes. It's going to be a two-week festival called Explore the Bredor. Oh, really? Where all the activities, uh, outdoor activities and concerts and everything that take place are going to come under one umbrella, and uh, we'll be able to promote that through CEPI, through uh, hopefully Tourism Nova Scotia, wow. uh, and uh, Destination Cape Breton. But anyway, uh, one of those things will be this uh, joint patrols will, we hope, will take place during that whole festival. So people right. will go around and just educate the boating public about the pump-out stations. Yeah, because it is really a lot about education, yeah. right? Yes. It really, yeah. really is. I think, you know, people want to do the right thing, but they don't know what they don't know sometimes. And um, You don't have a sense of the dates yet for that Explore yes, it's, the Bredor? Uh, last week of July, July, first week of August. Ends oh, wow. August 8th, I think. It's so even if these events are things, part so. of other festivals? Yeah. Yes, I know. So oh. we're approaching all the other municipalities and groups and like, oh, I like it. clubs and everybody and everybody like, you know, it's sort of like in Celtic Colors on the Lake sort of thing, you know? <laughs> Hopefully it'll get big oh, like that. <laughs> we got like three golf courses on the lake. Yeah. We've got like concert venues around the lake. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure we can yeah. wrap it up once everything. It has the potential to easily become an annual event, but for uh, sure, we'll, for we'll, sure, we'll play it uh, cool That's, this this year. And and yeah. um, Oceans North has committed a, a good sum of money to hire a coordinator to make sure everything takes place. As yeah. There's also a lot of citizen event. science stuff going on as well. That mm -hmm. will be the main focus of it. Will be citizen science and environmental concerns for the lake. All the okay. activities will have that kind of a focus. And now let's head over from the Bredore Lake watershed over to the Port Hawkesbury waterfront. The town has been busy over the past year putting together a new waterfront development plan and striking a waterfront development committee. So I'm going to ask Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton all about that, about recent developments on the waterfront, and about how a small park at the edge of the waterfront could soon be more open to local residents and visitors, and why that small park was cordoned off in this regard over the past few years. So let's talk waterfront with Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton right now. I think this particular uh, discussion is twofold because certainly um, a hidden gem, uh, not only for the town of Port Hawkesbury, but also for the Strait region, is the Strait of Cancel Zone. I mean, it's a, you know, a high capacity, ice free harbour and uh, there's huge potential in and around the, the Strait of Cancel Zone. Uh, and it's a huge asset for, for all of the municipalities and First Nation communities in the Strait region. What's going on right now with the, with the waterfront at the town of Port Hawkesbury, uh, we do have quite a lot of exciting um, uh, projects in progress. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we are currently in the process of developing a waterfront development plan. Uh, we have a very engaged, robust uh, waterfront advisory committee, and uh, they're certainly doing some, some great work. Uh, we are working uh, also uh, very closely with the Cape Breton Partnership, with NSCC, with DEVELOP, and other stakeholders uh, around kind of a an, um, an innovation uh, site, if you will. Like we, we do have to flesh out the, the idea a little bit more. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, NSCC now has renovated a portion of the Creamery building, which is uh, an important historical 
uh, site here in the town of Prudoxbury. So it's it's really nice to see new life breathed into the building, uh, that it's serving a, a function. Uh, NSCC and the Nautical Institute are amazing assets and partners for the town of Port Hawkesbury. Uh, so there'll be some ongoing training uh, occurring at the waterfront. We also have interest uh, from other companies uh, in Atlantic Canada that are interested in, in having portions of their uh, of training occur there for diving. Uh, and, and of course, uh, new businesses are interested in the waterfront. So, you know, things are, are definitely looking up for waterfront development and they will progress. I mean, nothing's going to happen instantaneously. It's going to take a, a really well-defined uh, business plan and a waterfront development plan for, for our waterfront. Um, other exciting, I guess, developments for the waterfront is around active transportation. Uh, we're hoping to connect uh, the North Granville Street Park, most recently uh, named Sunset Park, uh, to the existing waterfront uh, and to the existing walkway or boardwalk that's very heavily used uh, locally. Uh, so that that is going to be an amazing connector uh, that will encourage uh, active, healthy lifestyles in the town. And um, and since you know we are a town that's that's built uh, right next to the the ocean, it helps us reconnect uh, with our history, with the ocean, and with the sea. And um, yeah just developing uh, our waterfront so that we can rekindle that important history. Now, for this proposed active transportation connector between the waterfront and the North Granville Street Park, do you envision something similar to the active transportation trail that was established last year between the Nova Scotia Community College and the main commercial core along Reef Street? Correct. So although we don't have all of those those details uh, fine-tuned as of yet, um, the general consensus is that it, it will kind of look and function similar to that AT trail that, that's, um, that connects NSCC and Embry's Island to uh, our uptown core. Does the success of that active transportation trail make it easier for you, council and town staff, to start planning for other connectors around Port Hawkesbury, but also make it easier to approach various levels of government to share in the funding to construct these types of connector routes? The original intent of building that active transportation lane uh, was to remedy a 30-year-long uh, issue. Uh, there, there was a, um, a, an active transportation disconnect between our NSCC campus and Nautical Institute and the town of Port Hawkesbury. Uh, so up until, until the point that we were able to install that AT trail, uh, students who were not driving to the campus were, were walking along uh, the shoulder of the, of the road uh, and certainly not, not the safest uh, conditions to, to utilize active transportation uh, to get to the NSCC campus if students were living within town and walking or biking. Uh, so that, that AT trail was, uh, of course, a, a remedy to that longstanding challenge. Uh, once installed, though, what we soon realized was it was absolutely celebrated and well used by way more than just NSCC students. It was uh, heavily used from the onset uh, by um, citizens living in the town, by citizens living uh, around the town of Port Hawkesbury. Um, having that AT trail connected directly with our trail system as well has uh, you know, certainly encouraged a higher level of use in our other trails. And it's just, it's just been wonderful to see. So it definitely has demonstrated that um, active transportation uh, is something we can grow uh, in, in the town of Port Hawkesbury and for the region as well. Uh, so my sense is that uh, building active transportation at our waterfront is, is definitely going to reap some huge benefits around a health, healthy and active lifestyle for the citizens of the town. Now, if that trail goes through, you've mentioned that it would end up at the park area near the intersection of North Granville Street and Prince Street, overlooking the Strait of Canso and the Canso Causeway. 
Recently, Town Councilor Jason O'Coin requested that boulders that had been placed at the entrance to this small park area be removed so that more people would be able to access it. Can you give us a little bit of history as to why those boulders were placed there in the first place and what needs to be done before they could consider being formally removed? So I guess just to give a, a bit of a high-level history of, of that, that particular uh, piece of property, uh, so probably about three or four years ago, um, the there there was um, incidences of camping occurring on that property, uh, and uh, this this issue was brought to uh, council's attention by some by several citizens living very close to that North Granville Street uh, property. Uh, so we were made aware that there was actually a free camping website that was advertising that piece of property as a, as a place to go and park your RV or set up a tent and enjoy uh, free parking in the town of Port Hawkesbury. Uh, so the town, of course, as the, the owners of that property, had no prior knowledge of, of that this website uh, existed or that this particular property was was registered. There was certainly no permission given by the town to to register this piece of property on that website. In considering the concerns that were expressed by um, the citizens living in and around the, that property as well as other citizens in the town who had a lot of concerns uh, about that, uh, you know, especially around uh, safety and security and, you know, the property also kind of, you know, getting torn up with, with wheels and heavier vehicles as well as garbage being being left behind. So we tried to come up with a very quick and cost-effective solution to kind of create a, a barrier so that vehicles could no longer um, access that, that property, that green space. Uh, and, you know, keeping in mind that, you know, we did realize it's still quite heavily used by citizens who like to, to go and sit on, you know, sit on a bench and, or a picnic table and enjoy the view because it is an absolutely beautiful view. Uh, so uh, council did uh, make that, that decision, which uh, from the onset was a temporary one. Uh, we installed the boulders and to, to create that temporary barrier. And uh, and we worked to to make sure that that property was removed from that that website, so there wouldn't be any confusion to visitors coming to to Cape Breton Island. Um, so at the end of the day, though, uh, we're working really closely with our waterfront development committee, uh, with town council, and you know, with some other consultants and partners to determine, you know, what what can we develop that that uh, sunset park into, and what role and function can it play. It certainly will be connected through the AT Trail first and, and foremost, and what other functions can that property uh, have that you know can add benefit to uh, the lifestyle for the people in Port Hawkesbury and it's got a world-class view and uh, and we're, we're excited for whatever the future holds for that particular space. And that wraps up this week's edition of Talil 24-7. Thank you for joining me and thanks once again to Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton for giving us some interview time. And thank you to my Talil colleagues Becky Borino, Nick Boudreau and Cora LeBlanc for filming and formatting the footage from Richmond Council's Committee of the Whole. Of course, we'd always love to hear from you if you have some suggestions or ideas for future editions of Tell Ill 24-7, or if you just want to comment on what you've seen in the past hour. You can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863, and you can email me. The address is adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also contact Talil Community Television directly. The station phone number is 902-226-1928. And the best email to use is info at talil.tv. Don't forget to follow Talil on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Our YouTube channel features every single episode of Talil 24-7, including this one, as well as individual interviews and stories from these shows, and our sister French interview program, program Not Cote. And if you'd like to hear what Talil is up to and some local stories from our area, be sure to check out our podcast channel, soundcloud.com slash Talil. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode, and we hope to see you again very soon with a brand new edition of Talil 24-7. Talk to you then.